Good morning, good afternoon. This is Uta Jungermann speaking from WBCSD. Um, thank you very much for joining us uh, this morning and this afternoon, depending on where you are for this session with focus on making the SDGs actionable for business. We're very pleased to have so many of you with us today and uh, glad to share our experiences with developing uh, SDG sector roadmaps. I suggest we get going. I think we have a good number of participants now who have connected and a few more, of course, will, will join as we, as we go along. So with that said, um, please, can we move to the next slide? Thank you. So uh, as I said, my name is Uta Jungermann. I'm the manager here at WBCSD within our Sustainable Development, Development Goals program area. And I'm joined by my colleague, Filippo Velio, um, Managing Director for the People Program and Outreach at WBCSD, and also Florian Miko from the SDGs team who will be managing the technical side and background side. So please do feel free at any time to, to chat to us uh, or directly to all of us or to, to, to any uh, specifically Florian or uh, myself. Next slide, please. Just a few housekeeping items. Um, you've probably heard a voice and had a notification on your screen that this session is being recorded. We will make the recording available following um, the, this morning session and afternoon session once they're both completed. Um, participants are on mute and we, we ask you to stay on mute if possible, just to avoid any background noises and disturbances. And of course the slides and so on will be, um, will be shared uh, together with the recording once we have um, completed both, uh, both sessions today. Um, at any time, as I said, uh, please use the chat function in the main control tab to type your questions or comments. Um, you can also raise your hand so we can unmute your line. Um, but I think you can also simply unmute yourself and, and um, speak up at any time if you wish. So please feel free to do so. Um, just a few introductions. We're very pleased, uh, of course, to have an outstanding lineup of speakers with us this morning. Um, Every, all of these have been um, leading efforts to develop SDG sector roadmaps for their respective industries. So uh, with that, I'm really glad that Monica Oviedo is, is with us uh, this morning, Head of Sustainability at Iberdrola, um, joining us from Spain, representing the electric utilities um, sector. Uh, has Roma joined us now? Uh, I'm not sure. Roma, if you're there, please do say hello. <laughs> um, for the forest product sector, very glad to have Gladys Naylor um, with us, Head of, um, head of uh, Sustainable Development at Mondi, uh, joining us out of the UK, but originally from South Africa. And uh, Fenelope Samovan, SDGs Accountability Manager um, in, uh, at Total in France. Uh, thanks very much for, for being with us and representing oil and gas, the oil and gas sector. And finally, Lyndon Edgel from ERM, who will be moderating um, the, the panel discussion in, in a short bit. So uh, to all of you, thanks a lot for, for being with us and for, for sharing your, your insights today with us. Uh, next slide, please. Also, um, out of good practice, please be mindful of antitrust. Um, avoid an, any uh, discussion and any conversation um, comp competitively sensitive topics that can include pricing costs, uh, bid strategies, future capacity additions, um, customers or output decisions. And we've lost the slides, but that's probably because we're moving to a quick poll <laughs> on Mentimeter. Um, just to, um, before we begin, we wanted to ask you a quick question as to how you've uh, learned about this, this meeting. I hope it comes up on, on your screen now. There we go. So you can go maybe on your phone or in your, in your browser, you can go to menti.com and enter that code for 7492. And then you should see that question as to how you've learned about today's session. We just would like to know how and in which form you, you're joining us. A 
Are we getting any results yet? Uh, it's moving live. Okay, great. So most of you um, through a personalized uh, message, others through our website and uh, partner what network. I'll give it another minute to just see. Okay. Great. I suggest then um, we move on. Thank you. I see some people are experiencing issues with the sound. If that's the case, um, try, uh, sometimes it works to reconnect um, or to just, uh, in case you have your video on, just, just switch off your video um, to reduce uh, the amount of bandwidth that you need. Um, so sometimes that helps. So today's agenda, so we've covered most of the welcome and introduction and housekeeping. Um, I will soon pass over to, to Filippo, who will take us through the SDG landscape, some latest developments and trends, um, before I'll cover um, a, a quick overview of the, the work that we've been doing on SDG sector roadmaps, just explaining the concept and the framework. And then we'll hear from our speakers today on their insights and experience from, from putting, putting these concepts into practice before we open for, for question and discussion and, and wrap up uh, today's session. So again, thanks everyone for, for being with us. And with that said, I'll just pass over to, to Filippo. Thank you, Uta. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or even good evening. I saw somebody dialing in from Australia, so certainly good evening uh, to you uh, all. And uh, certainly uh, delighted to welcome you also on behalf of the WBCST team, alongside my colleagues Florian and Uta. Uh, delighted to be here today uh, with you. Um, a number of uh, you uh, might be external or unfamiliar with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. So on the next slide, Florian, we're just going to go through a couple of slides explaining uh, the WBCSD as its acronym uh, stands for an association of 200 uh, global uh, companies united by a shared commitment, A, on the one side uh, for business leadership to shape uh, the sustainability agenda uh, for the future and be guided by a strong belief that sustainability and business success uh, are connected, are in interconnected and mutually uh, reinforcing, uh, reinforcing and reinforced. Um, guided our work by a vision, as you see outlined here, of a world which by, which by, by mid-century uh, gathers uh, over 9 billion people living well within the boundaries of what the planet uh, can uh, sustain. So the idea of business leadership and the connection of uh, sustainability and business success at the core of everything uh, WBCSD uh, does. Uh, WBCSD, as I mentioned, is a group of 200 companies, a very warm welcome, uh, not only to the speakers from our member companies, but also to any uh, member company represented um, uh, today in the, in the membership, as you see outlined here uh, by the slides. We're delighted to count on your support. If you look at uh, industry sectors, we're talking about about 20 um, industry sectors and, and taking country headquarters. It's slightly more than 40 countries uh, in terms of headquarter, uh, company headquarters uh, location. So delighted to have you all here and also delighted to welcome our partners from global network uh, organizations from across the world. I've seen a few of them uh, lined up in the, in the Zoom um, participants list. Thank you so much also for being with us. Um, WBCSD, in short, is regrouped around uh, six uh, programs with its uh, underlying uh, program uh, areas. The topic of today, SDG sector roadmaps and SDG more widely, is embedded in our uh, people agenda organizationally. Uh, our six areas span uh, uh, quite a vast uh, range of uh, topics, as you can see here, uh, from the circularity agenda all the way to the uh, urban uh, infrastructure agenda to climate and energy issues, of course, but also uh, to the important elements around food and nature, uh, and certainly also around the challenges of measuring, valuing, and disclosing uh, company performance, which is outlined in redefining value. And of course, also the people agenda uh, strongly uh, embedded in our work program overall. For those who are interested, of course, there's a lot more information available uh, online uh, around specific programs, program areas, deliverables, 
uh, outputs and is all freely available uh, to anyone uh, interested. Uh, in light of the COVID um, pandemic, of the COVID uh, crisis, we have as WBCSD also been as reactive uh, as possible over the last, uh, well, well over three months uh, now, uh, setting up uh, a COVID-19, a so-called COVID-19 response uh, program, really trying to gather uh, members' um, desire to drive a collective action, to draw uh, insights from what the crisis is uh, displaying, but also to put together thoughts around what could be done uh, jointly over and beyond the great activities and great initiatives that many, many companies across the world of all sizes have been uh, rolling out to respond uh, through their uh, business, through their value chains, through their business relationships uh, all across the world to this uh, crisis. Uh, for those who are interested, you're more than welcome to visit. There is a dedicated uh, COVID-19 um, section on our uh, WBCSD uh, website where you can find more information around the response projects, which we have framed around three areas. We're looking at uh, vital supply chains with a particular focus on food. We're looking at the so-called return to new normal, looking in particular at uh, business recovery scenarios and at employee uh, health issues. And we're looking also at the long-term uh, impacts of this pandemic, articulating uh, thoughts and ideas on how this uh, pandemic is uh, shaping uh, the decade uh, ahead. But certainly, of course, I think we'll all agree that, uh, you know, the idea of 2020 being a crucial, if not super year for sustainability, in particular on some areas like climate and food, has certainly been um, shaped and accelerated even further uh, by the COVID-19 crisis and its consequences over the short, the medium and the long term. So certainly invite you to visit the website if you want to learn more, a lot of interesting outputs for you to uh, browse uh, through. In terms of today's agenda, allow me then just a few minutes uh, alongside my colleagues uh, before we tee up with our speakers and the great lineup that we have to share some perspectives around the landscape or around the sustainable <clears throat> development uh, goals in terms of the latest uh, developments and uh, trends. A few thoughts from our side around the, an agenda, a sustainability agenda that is both of course global and uh, increasingly uh, complex and from our side the desire. Next slide, Florian, please, to also speak a little bit more about how do we simplify the agenda uh, further and further, all the while drawing out the interconnectedness of issues. Um, at the end of uh, 2019 and early 2020, we were landing on these three pillars of climate emergency, uh, inequality and uh, nature loss, driving a lot of the priorities of companies uh, with regard to their engagement. But of course, as we can see on the next slide, we have been putting up this slide for, uh, well, uh, almost five years uh, now in terms of the roadmap overall, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals alongside the Paris Agreement of 2015, both uh, emerging from this sort of um, incredible year of 2015 in terms of multilateral concerted uh, action. The roadmap is very clear in terms of where we want to go, what has to be achieved, the direction of travel, uh, for the decade uh, ahead. If we look back just a little bit on 2019, we also see that uh, while 2019 uh, served uh, very um, strongly as a, a year of stock taking, how far are we along the Sustainable Development Goals agenda? Where are some of the uh, challenges? What are, what are some of the latest uh, data in terms of uh, progress? Uh, certainly shaping up that year in terms of stock taking so as to really enter 2020 with a strong uh, message and strong advocacy and strong actions, including from the business community around really entering a decade of delivery uh, over and beyond the decade of discussion of analysis and of um, concerted action, really very much also the onus on action by businesses, action by all societal uh, players uh, out there. Why uh, action? Because certainly in terms of the trends, we can see both sort of the glass half full and the glass uh, half uh, empty. If we take a little bit of a sort of before and now sort of a COVID-19 uh, period, before COVID-19, you can certainly point along the SDGs uh, four plus years into it to some positive uh, developments uh, in terms of some of the extreme uh, poverty and uh, child mortality rates continuing to, to fall. Uh, on SDG 3 around health 
and overall well-being, certainly progress in terms of uh, combat against a number of diseases, access uh, to energy uh, improved, uh, unemployment uh, started uh, to look uh, better after, of course, uh, many, many difficult years given the financial and economic uh, crisis that ensued uh, on the urbanization uh, trend, uh, positive trends, and also on SDG 14 on life below uh, water uh, with a glass half full perspective, certainly improvements. With a glass uh, half empty uh, approach and with a wearing, uh, let's say, lens uh, put on it, uh, wearing glasses on, certainly also a lack of progress, lack of progress when it comes to the, you know, the scandalous issues around uh, hunger and, and malnutrition, uh, certainly uh, lack of process, uh, progress uh, with regard to uh, the key uh, topics around biodiversity and uh, emissions. We, we, we saw the disappointment towards the end of last year around the COP25, which failed to deliver uh, maybe on, on many organizations' uh, ambitions. And certainly the progress around uh, poverty has been uh, slowed, uh, taking sort of a, a 30,000 feet uh, view. So this is sort of pre-COVID and now with um, the COVID-19 um, context, we certainly see also, uh, as we put it on the title here, uh, a number of setbacks and challenges that continue to um, intensify. Uh, if we think of, uh, we have all seen the statistics, I'm sure, uh, to varying degrees, how many hundreds of people will be pushed back into extreme poverty is anyone's guess, but it's certainly a discussion around hundreds of millions of people. So certainly a big setback on SDG uh, 1, a crucial um, goal in terms of uh, putting the world on a more sustainable uh, path. The, the extent to which the COVID pandemic has uh, affected uh, children is, is known uh, all over the world, uh, of course. The challenges around uh, domestic uh, violence, but more widely also uh, inequality in terms of uh, how the pandemic is hitting um, men uh, and uh, women has certainly also been uh, clearly articulated and, and, and is of course worrisome uh, when it comes to uh, SDG 6 around uh, water and sanitation and the access uh, to it. We see here we're talking about billions of, uh, of people and certainly worrying that uh, these um, challenges have been intensified. Uh, of course also linked to all of this is the challenge around unemployment. We have seen figures out of uh, developed and developing uh, countries that point to a a really steep um, rise in um, uh, unemployment and the challenges of uh, how will the, the, the recovery look like also in terms of job uh, creation or job um, sort of uh, recovery. And the last but certainly not least also, of course, if you look at the statistic of one third of world trade, which is expected to sort of diminish uh, in this year alone, it's certainly a, certainly a worrying trend with regard to interconnectedness, with regard to efficiencies, with, re with regard to costs to the consumer, and of course, with regard to livelihoods of many, many people uh, across many economies uh, in the world. So within that wider context, how can we look then at uh, progress uh, by uh, business? Just a, a few slides, uh, bear with me to talk you through our uh, narrative here in WBCSD in terms of progress. First and foremost, to position the idea and to continue to position the idea that uh, the SDGs cannot and will not be delivered without the role of uh, business, without a strong role of business in it. Uh, businesses of all sizes, from the very large ones to the uh, micro enterprises, business as an engine of employment, business as a source of finance, business as a source of innovation and uh, technology, but also business as a key actor in ensuring uh, respect uh, for human rights across value chains, uh, operations and relationships, certainly also a key actor to drive that fundamental baseline for the SDGs uh, forward. We see a lot of engagement across our uh, member uh, companies. There are just a few um, um, cutouts of, of various websites uh, featured here from all across the world and different uh, sectors. Business engaged with an increasing level of uh, sophistication, with an increasing level of depth, but also an increasing level of transparency with regard to how it is, uh, how it sees itself uh, contributing uh, to, the, to this agenda, through what kind of solutions, through what kind of uh, materiality lenses, through what kind of disclosure mechanisms. Certainly a lot of in interesting information available uh, out there and we'll come back uh, to that. At the same time, uh, our perception and, and shared with a number of our colleagues across uh, various uh, institutions, 
uh, organizations and peers uh, that business is not necessarily realizing, uh, unfortunately, uh, the potential it has to contribute uh, to this agenda. Uh, interesting statistics by our colleagues from the UN Global Compact here, uh, alongside uh, Accenture, who put together some interesting data, almost three quarters of uh, top executives believing that business can play a critical role in delivering the SDGs, all the while only one out of five of them really uh, putting the, the sort of the ticking the box when it comes to saying, uh, yes, business is um, playing a critical role right now. So certainly food for thought with regard to that uh, particular uh, gap. And another slide on uh, food for thought. Thank you, Florian, for forwarding the, um, the slide here uh, in that same um, output around perceived progress on business action. So we see here uh, uh, wide differences when it comes to this agenda. This agenda, of course, which is ambitious, which is interconnected, and which has implications for every country across the world. And here, interesting to see uh, when it comes to the data, the, the perceived progress with wide differences in terms of uh, percentage uh, points. As I was outlining before, we are entering, we have entered, in fact, uh, this decade uh, of delivery and uh, one of the key items here from our perspective in WBCSD is how do we really make the SDGs uh, more directly actionable for business. So from a business perspective of WBCSD, Florian, next slide please. How do we really look at the urgency uh, both of action but action that is driven really about uh, actionability, if that is a correct uh, English word. But how do you really land these SDGs? These SDGs, as our colleague uh, Guido Schmidt uh, Traub, uh, Executive Director of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, uh, outlines, is an incredibly um, powerful agenda in terms of outlining uh, the overall direction of travel. But as he puts it here, in themselves, these SDGs are not an action agenda. Uh, as it is sometimes put. And instead it is up to the scientific, the policy and the business communities to determine how these outcomes in the SDGs can be achieved at the various scales of uh, engagement. So this is what really drives our work also around the roadmaps uh, that we are uh, discussing today and uh, look forward to hearing the perspectives from the companies. I will just end with one single uh, slide here from my end before going over to the roadmaps in more depth handing over to Uta, it's just to point that for anyone interested in this agenda, we have through our SDG Business Hub uh, gathered across the years and even more so this year, the latest best practice, the latest outputs, the latest th thought pieces, the latest tools, including, I would like to emphasize in particular here, uh, so-called SDG, SDG Essentials uh, e-learning tool. Uh, you're more than welcome to uh, access it. Uh, it is soon going to be available in various languages. It is available in English all of the various um, outputs there available uh, free on the website and you're more than welcome to go and uh, browse uh, through them. Uta, with that I uh, believe I'm handing back to you for the third part of the agenda which is the conceptual part of the roadmaps before we give uh, the hand to our speakers. Great, thank you very much Filippo um, and please again remind, let me remind you to use the chat function if you have questions or comments of course, there will be time at the end as well to, to ask any questions and to discuss further. Um, if we move to the next slide, thank you. So um, as Filippo has outlined at WBCSD, our focus is very much on making the SDGs actionable for business. We do that at various different levels, um, but today we want to focus specifically um, on making the SDGs actionable for, for sectors. And we've been doing this now for a few years. Um, following the recommendations coming out of the business, um, Better Business, Better World report issued by the Business and Sustainable Development Commission. Uh, many, many recommendations came out of, the, uh, out of that report, but one was very much focused on, um, on sectors, on really developing uh, detailed uh, roadmaps to guide sector shifts in terms of sustainable development uh, in line with the, with the, with the SDGs on that journey to, towards 2030. And based on that recommendation, we developed a methodology, a framework together with, with ERM. And um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what, what this entails. So at first, of course, these sector roadmaps really uh, aim to, to offer a strategic uh, compass for sectors and companies, uh, offering a, a safe space for insight sharing, uh, but also learning uh, from peer to peer, so among, among peers from the same sector. Uh, but it also um, offers um, 
uh, a process to really unpack the complexities. Um, as Filippo has said, this interconnectedness of the SDGs, the various layers um, of the goals, the targets, the indicators, to really unpack the complexities of, of that agenda and then harness and unlock the opportunities that, that sit within, within, uh, within these goals. We look at these, um, sorry, just <laughs> two more points. Um, previous slide, thank you. Um, um, as a strategy as well to help maximize SDG impact uh, collectively, and then as a platform basically to, to, drive, to drive concerted and uh, to drive action uh, collaboratively. Um, all in all, next slide please, thank you. The, um, the roadmap goes through a, a three-step uh, framework. It first um, aims to set a common vision for the industry as to what, what the industry should look like by 2030. It then takes, takes it to today and says, okay, so what, what is the current SDG impact? How does the sector, how does our industry today interact with the SDGs, both in terms of uh, the positive impacts generated, but also the negative impacts? And then based on that analysis, um, explores the opportunities for, for, for greatest change, for, for impact, seeing where the greatest change can actually be, be realized. And then identifies uh, a number of actions to, to realize those uh, impact opportunities. And with that, we believe that sectors can really enhance the license to operate, better um, manage uh, risks, and also explore new, new opportunities for, um, for growth and uh, new, new business opportunities. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of roadmaps that we have already completed that include uh, the chemical sector who piloted um, the, the guidelines in um, 2018, and then shortly followed by the forest sector um, roadmap and the Indian cement sector roadmap that came in uh, 2019. And this year we're um, very busy and pleased to be working on three uh, roadmaps at the same time with the oil and gas sector, the electric utility sector and the tire, uh, tire sector as well. And we have representatives uh, with us uh, today and we're very glad to hear from them on what they are experiencing in this exercise. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail. I just want to tease you a little bit and encourage you to visit our website to find out more about uh, each of these roadmaps. Um, I just want to give you a flavor of what they look like. So I said they all follow the same, the same methodology. However, they do this methodology is flexible enough to, to, to balance out um, sector-specific um, uh, priorities and um, specificities. Um, the first sec uh, section of each roadmap always describes how the sector works and how it interacts with the SDGs, looks at um, where the positive impact is, where the negative impact is. It looks at some of the sustainability milestones of the sector um, that have already been accomplished. Before then moving on, um, to in the, into the second part of the roadmap, really identifying where the sector can have the most impact. And again, just two examples, two different visual um, visuals as to how sectors can articulate that in a simple in a simple way. I'm not going to go into the details of the data analysis that sits underneath, but there are just different ways um, to to articulate that and um, to um, to just again say that it's really important to look at both. Um, maximizing positive impact, but also understanding where the current negative impact is and how it can be minimized and therefore then actually drive positive change. And in the last uh, section of each roadmap, there are impact pathways, which basically conclude um, the roadmap and really lay out each impact opportunity supported by actions, supported by key partners or stakeholders that need to be involved in, in delivering um, the impact opportunity in action. It, under, it, it looks at the level of impact uh, on the SDG, so the level of impact um, on the goal, but also on the respective targets, which is really important in terms of the level of granularity uh, to, to really go into that level of depth. And it also looks at the, at the time horizon as to how long will it take to actually realize, um, realize that impact? Is it short, medium, medium or long term? Next slide. And finally, um, we've learned that these roadmaps are also a great means and, 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 and platform to 
uh, for CEOs to, to get engaged and to demonstrate their leadership and commitment to the SDGs. And we've had um, success in, in using this process and these outputs as a, as a, as a means to, to engage, for instance, at the UN level. So yes, it provides space for the, for the sector itself to, to engage, um, but also, of course, with, with other stakeholders, but then also to really take, take, the, take that sector level insight um, to the UN level and engage there with, with different um, stakeholders uh, outside, outside of the business, business sphere. And we've been leveraging our um, events that we're hosting um, at the UN uh, for, for, these, uh, for these purposes. Next slide. And I think with that, um, I leave you actually to pass over um, to Lyndon Edgel and the, the, the panel um, to hear from them. I think um, Roman has joined us from Michelin. So thank you very much for, for being with us, Roman Benz. I couldn't, I didn't, I think, uh, address you in, in the introduction because we didn't have you with us yet, but I think you are. Uh, Florian, if you could move to the next slide, just to, again, these are our panelists. I invite them now to unmute their lines and to, um, to maybe uh, switch on their video so you can actually see them. That makes it a bit more interactive. And um, the floor is, uh, is yours, Lyndon, and the, and the panel. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Uta. There's just one question that's come in that you might want to respond to before we ah. start. Do you want me to read it out or do you have it there? Uh, sorry, I hadn't seen. I, I apologize. Okay. So, <laughs> I <know you're> um, <laughs> trying to look at many things at the same yeah. time. So, um, um, no, we, we haven't we haven't done a roadmap for the IT sector. I, I think um, there are sort of a couple of exercises that have been done um, for the IT sector, but not within not within WBCSD. Great. Thanks, Uta, and good morning and good afternoon. Uh, to uh, everyone on the call. It's, it's great that you've joined us and we've got um, such a, a good crowd from across the world. Uh, thank you also to our panelists who've agreed to be part of the session today, representing some different industries uh, and different sectors who are working uh, through the roadmaps. Uh, Mondi, Gladys from Mondi is, is involved in the forest sector, which has completed theirs, uh, whereas the other three companies are involved in in projects that are live at the moment. And so we'll get the different perspectives uh, from those sectors uh, in, in how they've worked with the roadmaps. I'm pleased to say that uh, ERM's had the opportunity to be involved uh, with the original guidelines uh, and also now the six roadmaps in development. And I guess carrying that thread through the various uh, different types of ways of work and what we've learned over time has been really important. Um, so we can bring those learnings in uh, as we go through and also to adjust the methodology according to uh, the different sectors, their ways of work, the context, uh, and so on. And I think that that uh, opportunity for you now today to get the, the best insights from our panelists will, will help, uh, help you think about how you can apply this work um, in your own companies, in your own sectors, and for those perhaps like the IT sector who haven't uh, done one yet, maybe that's uh, something we can think about in the future. So thank you panelists and we'll start uh, with a question uh, for Monica and Rama just to kind of get us going is, you know, I guess we're really interested to understand what is it about the roadmaps that, uh, why is your company interested, um, why you wanted to be involved and take a leadership position in this and, and I guess what are your expectations out of the process? So Monica, I might start with you and then we'll go to Rama. Perfect. Thank you, Lyndon, and thank you uh, for the invitation and for all of you to be here with us today. So, Iperdrola uh, uh, realizes about the importance of the SDGs uh, in the year 2014. We started to listen about this new process in, in the United Nations, and uh, this is a sector uh, where private sector is a new actor. So I think this is a very important thing because uh, this is something new for all of us. It's something different. And I think this is also a very important and relevant feature that uh, we don't have to do the things as uh, business as usual. So uh, we have had these five years to use the SDG compass because I think that um, all, almost all of us, we have used the, the compass to 
internalize, to prioritize, to select our targets, to include in integrating the strategy and to communicate. So these are the five steps that all of us we have followed in, in these five years. But as uh, Florian mentioned before, uh, Filippo, sorry, uh, mentioned before, this, we just have 10 years to achieve these important challenges and to change completely change the, the things that uh, we, we are uh, working on. So in Iberdrola, SDG strategy is linked in the innovation and sustainability uh, perspective and uh, management team. We depend directly on the CEO. So I think it's very important for, for you to know that we know that we have to do the things in a very different way. And this is for, for example, we have to do it in a collaborative way. So the roadmap for us is an opportunity because, okay, we have, we have achieved a lot of things in these five steps that every company we have been doing uh, by our own or in, in, in partnerships, but we have been working uh, in our own. And now it presents a huge opportunity to work together and to share and to, to create this new perspective to, to learn because, okay, we can be very good in some targets and we can we have selected some targets, but perhaps another utility has selected another one. And this is a new opportunity, uh, as Uta mentioned before, new business opportunity. So this is, I think this is a completely change. Private sector uh, is a new actor and is working in a collaborative way. Uh, and we, we like to say that uh, it's so talent and, and so big the opportunity, there is no competition in this field. We have, we have opportunities for all of us. So uh, we, we, really, we really know that it's very important to, to share best practices and to be aligned and because we are going to, to achieve the, the, the targets and the goals if we work together. And we are doing that in, in a lot of specific projects that we are working with, with them in this, in this uh, issue. So this would be my, my first approach. Great, thank, uh, thank you very much. And Roma. Thank you a lot for the invitation. Do you hear me well? We do. Okay, and thank you, uh, Monica, for taking the floor, the, the, the floor first. Um, so, at Mission, yes, we were interested in on, on communicating on SDGs for, for a couple of years, and that's what we started to do on our uh, corporate website. But now we want to, to go uh, deeper to the real target of eight SDGs, that is to impact and to, so to commit and to impact, comparing today and tomorrow. Uh, but also, first, we, we, we saw that SDGs were mostly made or tailor made for, for countries and for companies. And considering the, the spirit of the SDGs, so about impacting, we, we quickly found that it has much more sense to work as a sector than a company. Um, from a, a company perspective, today uh, we have to report and to communicate on uh, what we do, our policies, our results, our KPIs uh, on CSR uh, topics. But we have to communicate on, on the basis of only our major issues or uh, most significant uh, challenges or impacts we, we have as a company. And uh, we also consider that maybe some stakeholders will consider that this selection we do uh, of what we consider as major issues or most important uh, challenges might not be considered uh, as sincere by our stakeholders. So it felt for us like uh, if we talk uh, as a sector uh, with almost all the companies of the tire industry, because TIP doesn't uh, represent all the companies of our sector, maybe it will be more considered as a sincere uh, commitment. Um, so tire sector, already uh, discuss uh, as uh, in something we call the tire industry project and tire okay sorry maybe i disconnected <laughs> uh, so the tap uh, today the tire industry project drives sustainability and is committed to to move forward on many initiatives uh, to make the tire industry more responsible more sustainable and uh, so we had this area where we already work on common uh, 
common uh, issues and where we commit, uh, where we we engage, where we, we try to make progress based also on, on KPIs. Um, but uh, also another great uh, opportunity for us to, to work on the SDGs as a sector is that it is uh, challenging the scope of the GAP because by now it's, it was limited to environment and, uh, and now we are invited through SDGs to consider also more social aspects uh, so that's maybe my, my first uh, answer to the to this first point. Yeah. Great, thank you to both of you. And I heard quite a bit in there about the importance of collaboration, which obviously sits in SDG 17 around yeah. partnerships and the opportunity to share ideas, best practices, challenges with others in the sector. Uh, I heard something around uh, a kind of a credibility question with stakeholders. So by by the sector actually taking on board that sector, uh, the stakeholder feedback, you're able to tackle some of the things that might have been more difficult for a company uh, to do alone around the level of change and the level of ambition that we need to bring through uh, the SDGs. Uh, and for something like the the TIP, the Tire Industry Project, it's it's helped move the, sh the focus from from one set of issues, environment, into a broader set of issues, which are of course integrated within the SDGs. So we can see the, the value of, of expanding a company approach uh, into a more of a sector approach. So it's not to say one is better than the other, it's to say we need, we need both um, in order to, to help progress things. So we've taken a slightly different approach when it comes to the, the oil and, and gas sector roadmap, and that is that um, WBCSD and IPICA, which is another industry organization, are working together. So, Penelope, maybe firstly outlined a little bit about IPICA because not everybody on the, on the mm -hmm. call might know about that. And I guess share with us, a, you know, some of the challenges about working in, again, that slightly uh, different way with, with two industry organisations together. What have you learned from that and, and the engagement opportunities uh, with that? Um, so, yeah, thank you. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to contribute to this, uh, to, to this um, chat. Um, yes, yeah, so IPICA is an international um, association which aim is to promote sustainability practices. I'm sorry, I have a little one here <laughs> coming to say hi. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so IPICA um, uh, aim is to engage with the overall oil and gas industry to promote sustainability practices, environmental, climate, social, societal. It has about um, 70 members, not only companies, but also associations um, and ETCs. So it's very interesting because it covers about 40% of global oil and gas production and uh, generates a lot of um, cooperation around those topics. Um, the partnership came from the fact that in 2017, IPCA had produced and published a atlas outlining how the oil and gas industry relates to the SDGs. And it was a very interesting piece of work which allowed uh, the whole industry to translate those SDGs into something that um, makes sense for business and makes sense for the industry. And we had been working uh, within a task force to try and promote it and uh, make it more available across all our members. Um, but being part as well of the WBCSD, it was very interesting to see um, the methodology that was produced to put together a sectorial roadmap, um, mainly because one of the first steps was one that uh, the industry had already done. So we thought that maybe this would be a very good opportunity to level up and step up um, the work that we were carrying out and try to see really where the oil and gas industry can make an impact. So working with IPICA was a, a, a very interesting um, path forward, but it also presents its challenges. One of them is that um, IPICA is very much consensus based. And we have companies of different size with um, different ambitions, with different maturities, but also with um, um, different notions of what diversification might be. And so we needed to make sure that we will be able to deliver a roadmap that would be at the level that some of the most advanced companies were expecting, at the level of ambition that was set by the WBCSD, and yet would also, uh, will, will also be agreeable by um, the companies that form part of IPICA. 
So um, there was a workforce that was implemented with a few companies that were um, that drove, I would say, the work um, with RM and IPIGA. And one of the very important things that was done from the beginning and that was very helpful throughout the process was that um, IPIGA is um, has a governance with the next com an executive committee with representatives from most of our companies. It was decided uh, from, from the beginning what the level of ambition, what the action plan and what the principles of this SDG roadmap should be. And so that was very helpful because as we carried out our different workshops and started identifying what SDGs could be potentially interesting for, for the industry and what kind of action plan or impact opportunities we could uh, identify. There were obviously many discussions around us and, and um, coming back to these principles that were agreed up and starting the work was very important because we could always aim for better and aim for um, a, a level of ambition that um, it's not finished yet, but that would be deemed um, in, in interesting and up to the expectations of our external stakeholders. So I would say the most in, in challenging piece is obviously getting to agree on that level of ambition, but then the, the fact that we have XCOM approval and a mandate to work on something that will be ambitious enough and bold enough, that was very important. The second thing that personally I found um, challenging as well is that um, at Total, we have been working for a number of years on SDGs now. And, and just as for Iberdrola, I think we looked into the compass and looked at what they meant for us in terms of implementing a strategy that goes along the lines of SDGs. And I think one of the, the, the things that can be easily done is a huge list of good actions that are already implemented. And it's actually the following step that is um, difficult to make, which is where can I really be impactful where is the topic on which we need to make a step change to accelerate transition? And so having that discussion between moving from a list of collection of important and nice things that we're already doing to what can we do better? I think it's um, something that um, is worth having as a discussion, but it's an, a, a challenging one. Yes, I think, I think that question of ambition is one that's come up each time and, and how, um, you know, how much is the roadmap for the, for the members alone? How much is it to drive the sector? And of course, everyone else in your value chain um, as well. And I think the fact that those conversations are happening is, is in and of it themselves a really important um, discussion to be having, as well as what comes in, in, the, in the roadmaps at the end. So certainly, certainly I think you'll find that um, challenge. And I think, you know, there may be well many iterations of the roadmaps mm -hmm. over, over the years ahead as that ambition is, is raised and your stakeholders push, I suspect as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, moving on to, to you, Gladys, and you know, obviously the forest sector uh, work is, is um, well, the roadmap's complete, the work's certainly not complete. Um, Mondi, again, had done quite a bit of work coming into um, to the, to the roadmap timing, and I guess we'd be interested to say, you know, how has working on the roadmap influenced the way Mondi was thinking about the, the SDGs and perhaps vice versa, for, and, and I guess what's, what's um, uh, I guess, influenced you to, to take things another step forward uh, within Mondi's um, circumstances. Yes, thank you very much, Lyndon, and hello, everyone. So as part of developing our forest sector SDG roadmap, we had lots of discussions about the approach that we should take. On the one hand, recognizing the interconnectedness and also the importance of all 17 SDGs, but on the other hand, also recognizing that as a forest sector, we had a particular contribution to make in, in some of the, the most material SDGs. So we really spoke about the merits of, of taking an approach where we have a deep dive across the board into the SDGs compared to us focusing in on those where we as a forest sector have a particular and unique contribution to make. And that I think has also influenced us as Mandi in how we have thought about the SDGs and translated us into us really considering at a, at a target level, where are those areas where we as a business have the biggest potential to make a positive contribution, but also conversely recognizing where we, as we stand today, also have a negative contribution to, to those SDGs. Um, so I think as a, as a, 
Forest Solutions Group, we thought carefully about those impacts, both positive and negative, and then um, translated that into what actions we need to be taking. And I guess then the immediate question that follows that is, is the question of how you then measure impact. So I'm sure as, as many other companies are looking at plotting our commitments as we go beyond 2020, it's also helped us to think about what those metrics are and what the indicators are that we can use to evaluate our progress effectively. And I'm sure that uh, there are other companies that have this experience. We've recognized that in some instances, those are largely um, qualitative, but also that it's important for us to find those quantitative metrics that, that help us to measure and communicate on impact. And, and Gladys, just while I have you there, I mean, the, the forest sector took, a, uh, again, a slightly different approach to the, the chemical sector before you in terms of actually engaging with key external stakeholders during the development um, of the roadmap, uh, groups like WWF and IUCN. I guess, how, how did that um, help you in through the roadmap process um, in, in terms of the group discussions, but also what you, you found as the, the impact opportunities? And, you know, what would you suggest to other groups as they're thinking about involving external stakeholders? Yes, yeah, so as Forest Solutions Group, we engaged with a dozen external um, stakeholders as part of the process. And we had the interviews with the stakeholders at the very early stage of developing our roadmap. Um, and then as a second follow up round, we also um, had further discussions with them once we developed the first draft of the roadmap to get feedback. And I'd say that one of the real benefits of, of bringing the external perspectives into the discussion is that it helped to um, really validate and, and help us to understand some of the assumptions that we as a forest sector had made. Um, I think it was Roman that earlier um, commented around the credibility of these roadmaps. And we found that involving such a broad range of external stakeholders really gave us the opportunity to bring in that external perspective. And if you look at um, if you take a look at our roadmap, which is on the WBCSD website, you'll see we also indicated some of those different perspectives in relation to how our stakeholders perceived the contribution and the impact of the, the forest sector compared to how companies within the sector who potentially are closer to the activities perceive that. So it was a really good um, check for us to make sure that we were responding to both what our stakeholders were expecting to hear from us, but then also communicating our own um, understanding of where our actions contribute. Great. And, and Penelope, thinking about, I mean, you're in the middle of the process still, but I guess what conversations are you having internally in total to think about you know, the roadmap uh, and its application to, to your own company's work, as well as your contribution to how the sector will take it forward? Absolutely. Well, um, as I mentioned before, uh, we went through a whole process of um, reassessing um, and restructuring our CSR approach very recently, and we did so in line with the SDGs. So one thing that is interesting from this roadmap is that on certain topics, it will resonate very much as some of the topics on which we have accelerated transition and notably in regards to climate. So I think on one hand, it will reinforce and um, reassure as well some of the choices that have been made and notably the fact that um, we, Total announced early in May an ambition towards uh, carbon neutrality. And so then those topics are core for us to continue pursuing um, a step change in the industry in those regards. Then on, the, on others, what would be very interesting is that um, this piece of work is being done at the industry level. And uh, now there might be some topics on which uh, there are lots of things to learn from some of our peers as well. And so identifying those gaps on which we can potentially improve our, uh, our processes and um, make potentially um, new, leading new ways um, on social and environmental topics will be very interesting. So I think it, it will be one of those um, roadmaps that will be shared with some of uh, the functions within the company to assess where, um, in addition to the work that we're doing, where we can see more collective action, I think. Um, and um, uh, where, where I would link with uh, the motto from WBCSD is lead and succeed. Um, so I think 
a very important topic for us is to lead by example. And um, we know that uh, within our industry, we're not all at the same level of ambition or even on the same level of maturity in terms of a sustainability path. So uh, implementing this action, this roadmap and, and in impact um, opportunities and action proposed and show that it is possible, um, I think would be a very good way to level up um, the, the industry overall. Um, so it might not be a roadmap where um, there will be perceived a step change for some of the companies that are most advanced. But I think the, the, main, um, the main message here is that if all could potentially adopt some of the impact opportunities that will be presented, then we will have a sectorial um, difference and, and potentially a, a very good contribution as a sector to the agenda. So it's yes, going back to Total, um, it will be shared internally and I think it will be in response to some of the expectations that our stakeholders have led to us, notably in regards to climate and the fact that we need to be an actor of um, a just transition that also includes a social element to it. Great. And I think that's one of the key things that, you know, all the companies involved today and indeed the sectors have found is that you know, once the roadmap's in place, it can become a, a tool to engage stakeholders internally and externally. And, and Monica, I'd be interesting to, to hear about how you're thinking, um, again, you're, you're still in the process of, of developing the roadmap, but how are you thinking about using uh, the roadmap to inform and, and influence decision making within the sector? Of course, the utility sector is, is, is quite diverse across the world. It's, it, you know, some of them are global companies, some are quite regionally based. So how do you see the roadmap helping the sector in, engage your stakeholders? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, indeed, we we are uh, still working on the on assessing and and uh, selecting the main opportunities uh, for for the. But what we are looking for is to to share all these initiatives, and we are seeing that after COVID crisis, uh, clients and communities and, and local employees uh, will be key stakeholders that perhaps weren't so important before. So we are um, taking that uh, these stakeholders will uh, increase their, their our, mat our maturity matrix will radically change in the, in the following months. So because of that, we have already started to work very closely uh, with these three stakeholders that perhaps in in other in other times we we weren't taking so uh, so deeply so this is a big opportunity because as we are now in the moment of of selecting the the roadmap and finalizing what we are going to do is we we have a stakeholder hub a stakeholder uh, forum uh, and in petrola so what we are going to do is to share it in our in our hub in our forum and we will be including all the comments and all the uh, best practices uh, with clients employees and and the supply chains mainly in this three after the COVID crisis Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that sounds really important and a, and a great opportunity and particularly, in, yes, in these very changing times, how, how we that's can use true. the roadmaps as one of the tools to, to have those yeah. conversations that are going to be so important. I, I would like to say that it's really incredible because uh, we had our first session in, in Paris, a, a, a present session in Paris uh, to, to work on the roadmap. I think it was at the at beginning of March or something like this. I think was it was one of the first meetings that we have to cancel because of the uh, uh, COVID crisis. And when we postponed it in, in, in February or in March, I don't really remember that we have to, to, to cancel it. We didn't know that we were going to be able to work uh, in the roadmap during the crisis. And it has been incredible because we have had more than four sessions and working on a specific circular economy, water, electrification. We have been working a lot and, and it has been really a very good opportunity to work within the crisis uh, in the roadmap. And that's, yeah, I think that's great to see that dynamic um, nature of, of both the process and obviously the stakeholders and what will be the outcomes um, for, your, for your exercise. I mean, just while we're, I guess, thinking about 
um, about COVID and uh, I guess how it's changed everything for, for us. It'd be interesting to get your thoughts now from each one of you about, okay, how is, how is the, 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 the current sort of response to the pandemic either influenced the roadmap that's already finished and, and the implementation side or those that you're getting close to finalised? Um, and, and I guess, you know, from the, from the SDGs themselves, how do we think about that in relation to the responses from, um, from COVID and, and what comes next? So, Raman, maybe we'll start with you and then work around uh, each of the, the panellists. Thank you for your question. Uh, I think I won't have much to say about the second part of your question about how uh, the COVID crisis may influence the SDGs by now. For, for me, it's too soon. It's like uh, when we are asked on the uh, business impact of the COVID. Uh, what I can say is that uh, COVID-19 didn't change much our timeline uh, for the roadmap. Uh, maybe also for two reasons, but so the, the, the tools uh, and uh, the method used by ERM on, one, on the one hand and on the other hand, uh, probably the fact that we are already used to communicate within the TIP uh, as TIP members. Um, so it didn't uh, slow slow us down or modify uh, the scope uh, or, what, or the intent that, uh, of what we are doing. It did at least, uh, anyway, in fact, affect the process in terms of interaction with our stakeholders, with the, the interviews process. Uh, it caused some delays, um, and that was a critical point, also because the, the, the main difficult difficulty at this part of the process is to, um, to, to, to all agree on what stakeholders to, to interview after this difficult part of the process and some of the, some of the stakeholders weren't uh, able to, 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 re to answer at this, uh, our questions of the interview process and so on. But that's all, all the, the, the negative impact it had for us. Right. Um, Penelope, how, how's, um, I guess, in, in the work of your, your particular sector group, how have you been thinking about the, the response to the COVID well, pandemic? Well, um, COVID was a very interesting topic for us. It uh, led to a number of discussions because um, I think like uh, many other industries, uh, we all contributed and looked into how we could uh, potentially change some of our industry and production lines to uh, produce some um, solutions for, for to fight for this pandemic. There were donations and there were also a number of um, initiatives that were undertaken either on the supply chain or for the people. And obviously the level of answer was quite different from one company to the other. And so a question mark was uh, raised as to whether we needed to include some of those examples within um, the roadmap. And I think um, while we're still looking at it, we figured, well, the, the, the pandemic is current and it might not be where we're expected to have an impact globally. Uh, do we, are we expected to have an impact on pandemic? But, um, it, so if it might not change how we are looking at the roadmap, it did bring a newer light to SDG3 and to the fact that as an industry, we're quite present in a number of countries and some of them that require lots of support from a societal perspective. So. There, there's still discussions going on um, within the, the roadmap um, working group to see how this is being introduced and how this is being considered. But um, I was just looking at the slide that uh, Filippo um, shared before, which is basically what are the outcomes of this COVID and it's going to have a number of impacts, notably in terms of job security, of, um, of ensuring decent work within the supply chains and poverty. And so I think, if we may not address uh, COVID per se within the roadmaps, I think there are other topics that cover some of those impacts, notably on the geographical footprint um, and the job capacity, the job creation capacity that our industry has, and that will be very important to maintain and ensure that the, the contribution to society that we have seen so far um, is pursued despite um, the, the crisis that we're, probably in, in going to face in the month and years to come. And, and Gladys, I know you put something in the chat, but perhaps if you just want to share again, you know, the way the, the, the forest sector has been thinking about the response to COVID. Sure. I think 
Um, particularly, I've been considering and all of the calls that we hear to build back better to for resilient recovery for, for the new normal. And I think um, Filippo also mentioned in his introductory comments that we, we know what we need to do. We've had the SDGs since 2015, and I don't think that there's anything particularly, I mean, uh, clearly some different focuses that we've we've seen now with COVID that we need to build into our, our approach. But I really think that this emphasizes again the critical importance of resilience and the both the resilience of, of our planet and of our, our businesses. So making sure that we are considering the interconnectedness in our supply chains and really how we support um, the resilience across our entire value chain is is critical and, and I think is is very much emphasized in what we've seen um, being the impacts of COVID across our businesses. So so topics such as um, water stewardship, um, such as making sure that we practice sustainable forest management. I think all of these contribute to us having a resilient um, and a resilient business that's able to cope with the stresses that come. I think COVID in particular has shown us, um, you know, there are areas where we need to make sure we have increased focus and, and understanding of, of an impact such as a global pandemic. But overall, I do think that we already know what we need to be doing. I think COVID has just, for me, really shone a light on the critical nature that, uh, that we need to, you know, the critical importance of, of resilience in our, our businesses. Yeah, I think resilience is absolutely a strong theme coming through. And I think that's probably sits at the heart of the SDGs in many ways, doesn't it? Recognising that interconnectedness. And Monica, if you'd like to share with us, again, you've put some in the chat, but perhaps you know, yeah, your, I guess, I both the company and the sector's response. I was asked before before your question, I, I was asking the, in the chat, so I share the link with the, with the summary, but I would uh, like to, to agree with Gladys. I think that supply chain uh, will, be, will be key. And... Uh, the uh, utility sector is uh, very capital intensive, so we have to assess now uh, which are our needs in, in the near and medium term uh, future, because, okay, the mm -hmm. demand will completely change in, in a lot of countries that we are present. Uh, so mm, we have to be assessing which are our necessities and we will have to, to support and to, to reinforce the green concept, green recovery concept. This is a priority for us and because of that what we have done is to uh, support our supply chain to to uh, um, uh, put on no not put on sorry to to increase now the number of of uh, purchases in our supply chain in order to to help them to work uh, in the in in this month so what we have done is is to increase the number of investment uh, in in this uh, critical months uh, in order to support uh, these uh, uh, medium and small businesses that could uh, be really very bad influence. So I think it's, it's very key to work on the supply chain. And because of that, we have included this supply chain concept in our uh, management variable fee. Uh, uh, in the annual general meeting, uh, we have included this sustainability concept and I think and I would like to point out that it's a very good and key practice to link the contribution of the SDGs with the variable uh, uh, retribution of, of the management um, uh, uh, company. So I think it's very important this, this kind of sustainability objectives and because of that we have linked this year one a supply chain target with the variable bonus. All right, that's a really interesting development definitely. Um, we had a few other questions for the panelists, but I think we might move to, to questions from uh, those on the line. What I'll do first is just pick up a couple out of the, the chat box, but, um, but after that, if anyone wants to um, ask another question, they can either come off, uh, come off mute um, if we've got the facility or, or type it in chat. Um, we, we've talked a little bit about it already, but um, I guess as, as we're in this particular setup, both in terms of jobs within our companies and within our sectors, which will be impacted, um, but also, the, as you've just pointed out, support to small businesses. Does any of you want to comment about linking the thinking from the roadmaps to, to the question of jobs and employment and, and the future of work as we go forward? Uh, 
Penelope, I might pick on you because obviously the the oil and gas sector is, uh, you know, the oil price being at uh, you know a low for a long time, there's, and and just kind of the dis total disruption to that sector. And I guess if you want to share some thinking that that you might have had around uh, around jobs. Um, well, uh, um, from this perspective, I want to talk from um, um, Total's point of view because I think each of our companies um, is reacting in a different um, way. But um, the, um, this year is a particularly difficult year for the industry because not only do we have the COVID crisis, but we are we also entered this uh, year with um, a very um, dramatic drop in oil prices which has led to a lot of turmoil, which in addition to COVID has led also to a really drop, um, a big drop in oil demand. So it's um, a, quite a complicated situation for the industry. And we have seen a number of announcements of, uh, about job production. Um, from a total perspective, I think we, we are aiming to maintain the current level of um, jobs while we are stopping on, on hiring. Um, because I think the first responsibility we've got is towards our own employees and try to maintain the decent conditions of jobs that we have currently. Um, and continue preparing the future because one of the things that we're very committed to currently is to, to the transition. So we have had to reduce our investments, but we're maintaining those um, that are related to low carbon energies. So this SDG 13 is still very much focused and is linked to uh, maintaining also jobs and creating new opportunities uh, for those to come. The only area where we might be hiring is precisely on those new jobs that we still do not necessarily have within the company that are related to low carbon. So we need to continue preparing the future and that's going to be a, a matter of resilience. Um, coming back to the sector and to the roadmap, um, one interesting topic on which we touched on um, as we were talking about impact is how can we promote best practices in terms of employment within our supply chains and how can we contribute to supporting those countries that are currently oil and gas producers and that are going to have to face this transition. So it's not only about this current COVID crisis, it's actually about the long-term scenarios for a decarbonized economy. So um, it will be interesting to see how we end up putting those impact opportunities together, but um, we're contributing as an industry to the transition of countries that are dependent upon resources that might not be needed at the same level in the future, I think it's going to be quite a challenge and we don't all have the answer and it will require a lot of partnerships because obviously it's the main um, responsibility of the states that are concerned, but we are part of the, the, the landscape and we need to be part of the solution. So I think, yes, we're still going to have quite uh, a few interest conversations around uh, job creations and uh, decent jobs in the future. And I think it'll be interesting as particularly in those economies which are so dependent on, on the energy sector to, mm. to think about their SDG country plans mm. and, and are they actually ready for the transition within their country plans and, and again the roadmap might be a great platform for engaging between the, the, the sector and those economies that are so heavily dependent on that and, and what does that mean uh, as they you know refresh their plans and, and so on going forward. Um, Gladys, we've got a question from, from Anne in the chat that said it looked like food was not prioritised in the SDG pathway for forests. Um, can you explain why? That's an interesting question and I'd be um, interested to hear the, the background as to why um, food was highlighted. Um, I'm just wondering what the context was in relation to the forest sector. So, so Anne, I'm not sure if you can come off mute or... Oh, okay, Anne can't come off mute. <laughs> okay, so so Gladys, you might have to second, just second guess. I can't, I guess, about because there were conversations certainly about you know in, as we develop the forest sector roadmap about particularly communities that are, are quite dependent, uh, indigenous communities and so on that are quite dependent on forests. But 
Yes, I guess perhaps it's it's relating to the issue of land use and and access to to land potentially used for food crops versus land. Um, used to produce fiber, I would guess that would be the um, potential link. And there, um, what I would say is that we um, looked at the topic of land in the context of, of the the forest sector and in particular the engagement with communities and with other stakeholders um, around being stewards of, of land. So really considering um, not only the, the forest sector, but also the other sectors who potentially in the areas where we operate are, are making use of, of land. So I guess it's more in relation to how we engage with the stakeholders, our neighbors and communities um, in the areas where we operate. And that would really be the, the priority for us to make sure that we are in um, discussion with and in contact with communities so that we are engaging around topics where there's potentially any conflicts around land use. I, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but yeah. Yes, it was, uh, so Anne's just put in the chat, it was around land use, biodiversity, new forms of food. Yeah, so I think you covered that there. Yeah. Great. Um, I'm, I'm going to just pause and see if anyone uh, would like to take themselves off mute and, and ask a question directly. And I know that can just take a moment. So we'll just pause and see if anyone wants to, uh, to attempt that part of the technology. Otherwise, please keep posting uh, questions in the chat. I'm not sure. If, I don't think anyone's raised their hand. Okay, no one seems to be coming off. So I'm, I might just go to you, Roma, to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the tyre sector, obviously one of the, the key parts of, of, um, of your sector's approach will be thinking about your supply chain. And there's obviously a, a strong link there to, uh, to biodiversity, to jobs, to communities and so on. Do you want to share a little bit about um, how you're engaging with some of those stakeholder groups uh, in the development of the roadmap? Yeah, sorry, I was unmuting. Yeah, you're right. Um, I, it, I would like to, it, it's pretty soon. We just uh, made the interview review. I don't know if, uh, uh, what can I say? I can say at least that um, we, we we had some discussion to, to on who to prioritize uh, around the world because we, we had the stakeholders uh, on, on uh, the rubber, rubber industry. Uh, that organized per uh, regions, and so it was about uh, if we interview the one from Europe, what about the one from North America or Asia, and so on. So that was a, the point. But it may be more easy for us than what, what one of the panelists uh, just said a couple of, of, of minutes before, because um, we uh, about our purchase. Uh, it's mostly for all of us about natural rubber and about our value chain and, and then clients. Uh, it's people who buy tires and distribute tires. So as we engage, as we commit uh, as, as, a, as a tire sector, I would not say it's automatically, uh, it will automatically drive also the, the stakeholders, but I think it's, uh, it, it may be much more uh, easier or, than what has been said yet, maybe by uh, Monica or, uh, no, no, let me say. Uh, yes, maybe Monica, who was talking for the sake of energy, but um, I don't have much to say about this right now. Okay, okay. Um, Monica, did you have anything to add then about, around kind of stakeholders that we haven't captured already? No, I think that we have covered all the, all the main points. So from my side, it's okay. Okay. I mean, there's a, there's a few questions in the, in the chat about um, whether, whether this methodology could be applied to different sectors. And, and certainly mm -hmm. the methodology has been developed that it could be applied to, to any sector. Um, the roadmaps that have been developed to date um, have come from where there are existing sector group, so an existing group of companies who have already exist um, largely um, because they, they, they work through a different, something like the tyre project or the forest sector group um, or something like IPICA collaborating with, with WBCSD. And so, you know, so those mechanisms 
with those existing working relationships certainly provide a good home for the roadmap process to take um, within. And so if there are other industry groups or existing sort of associations of companies who are interested in the process, by all means, get in touch with the SDG team and, and initiate that. Um, but it, I think, you know, from our experience with working with the different sector groups, it really does need that existing group of stakeholders, group of companies who are prepared to invest the time, um, the energy, um, the expertise, and and uh, and I guess be prepared to go along the process to identify, you know, those impacts, um, to have the conversations around some of the positive and some of the negative impacts, and then come together to determine ambition and, and set out those impact opportunities. So, it is it is certainly um, a rigorous process, I would say. Um, it's certainly one that we're again, in, as in a lot of these activities, the actual process itself delivers real value as well as um, the outcome at the end. And it's important to take the time to have that dialogue uh, and that engagement with stakeholders. So I think I'd just add that. Um, we might just do sort of one final round around each of the panelists just to for you to share with those um, on the call, I guess, what uh, what advice um, or recommendations you, would you give to anyone else who's thinking about embarking on um, uh, the sector roadmap process? Um, and any advice, I guess, to WBCSD or others about you know what what could change going forward? So, um, Ramon, I think you're still on there. So, if you want to go first, and then we'll go around each of the panelists. So, what advice would you give to others um, thinking about the roadmap process? Yes, yeah, thank you. And also to to follow up with your, your previous comment about the, the methodology, because for us, uh, it, it, it seems like the methodology is, is pretty uh, very good, but it, it puts a high responsibility on the shoulders of the person who is in charge of interpreting and consolidating everything. So uh, what we what works well for us as a TAP is that uh, we have several levels of involvement. So we we have this the system with a uh, short working group with only three companies. Uh, and then we have more extended interviews and then we share uh, even more extended uh, uh, statements of what has been decided. But the, the interesting methodological point is that it depends on each uh, sector. It, it, it leaves each sector the, the freedom to decide how far they want to go. Because what we can see uh, is that uh, the main critical point is about committing. Uh, there is two steps. One step that is the map, maybe, and then the step about the road. How we, how, how we act today, what, how we impact today, and then how we would like to commit uh, to impact tomorrow, and that's the most critical part. Uh, so, from what we we looked at on the previous uh, sector, who worked on the roadmap before, uh, I would say that we are uh, very. Uh, we are mostly today discussing on how we want to impact after. What would the, the road? Uh, be because should we? I mean, should we set uh, quantitative targets, or or should we uh, just uh, uh, propose a new maturity matrix and, and consider that uh, that's uh, that's enough by now? Um, so that, that's for the, the the next step for us, the most critical points. But about also the feedbacks. Um, what I wanted to stress was, uh, um, yes, uh, to, to involve the CEOs, basically. This is what, what, uh, what allows us to, con to, to put so many resources in terms of what you said, people and time uh, on, this, uh, on this work. Yeah, definitely leadership involvement is important. Um, we're a bit short of time, so Maria, is there, uh, Monica, sorry, is there anything to add that uh, we haven't already covered in terms of advice? Yes, perhaps uh, cheer up the companies that who uh, haven't taken the step to, to go into this exercise, because I think uh, we are very used to work in bubbles and we are working our, in our uh, inside company and we don't have the opportunities to share so many uh, activities. So I think it's very important to do this sincere exercise 
to share how you are uh, uh, comparing the rest. So I really uh, feel the rest to, to take this step forward. Great, important. Penelope, anything, uh, any other advice that hasn't been covered already? Uh, well, um, from our side, I think um, the, the fact that the whole um, discussions happened and, and the COVID felt onto us, um, I think it was uh, very hard to pursue and keep the momentum going uh, with the, the companies that had been participating and maybe two roadmap or two workshops to work on the roadmaps um, is a little bit ambitious to, to get everyone on board and agree on a common vision. And maybe the last point for me would be that it's very important to very set from the beginning the expectation of um, the, the, the kind of expertise we need in the room because at the end of the day you have a couple of representatives from the companies that might have an overview that is quite wide for their industry or for their own companies but you need to get into some kind of technical discussions to be able to understand where you want to go, whether it's on environment, on climate, on social, on employment. So identifying the right people, I think, is key. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Gladys, anything else from your side? So perhaps just a, a couple of comments I would make is to emphasize um, what you've said, Lyndon, about the value of the process. I would really say for any companies considering doing this, that there's real value in the process that you go through to get to develop your roadmap, but then most certainly it's not a once-off exercise. So it's an ongoing um, activity that once you've developed the roadmap, there's then the actions that need to be taken to deliver those those impacts. So I would certainly recommend the value of, of this roadmap development process. Great. And thank you, thank you, panelists, um, for your wisdom, for, um, for responding on the way through to particular questions and for sharing, I guess, where you're at, those who've kind of done round one and those who are in the middle of it. It's, um, it's been really valuable. Which I know we're short of time, so I'll hand it back to you for the, for the wrap up. Thank you. Um, allow me as well from WBCSD side, of course, to, to thank um, all the panelists uh, for their great um, insight sharing, for, for the great conversation. Thank you, for Lyndon, for managing um, through this and guiding us uh, through this. Uh, also, of course, to everybody who actually um, asked a lot of questions through the chat. I think it's been a very animated conversation. So um, thank you. Thank you very much. Before we close, um, I do want to give you just a few um, points um, on your way. Um, Florian, if you could just move to the next slide. So just FYI, I'll be very quick, um, but along with so many other events, for good obvious reasons, uh, the High Level Political Forum, which is of course the big event of the year in terms of SDGs and SDG implementation and progress measurement and so on, uh, is also moving to a virtual format. Um, the actual theme and, and topics haven't changed, but of course the format has to adapt given the, the situation in which we're all in. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that our uh, event, which we've been hosting for a number of years now, um, together with UN DESA, will be on the 14th of July. Um, it will be in the US morning virtually uh, for the European afternoon, just for information. And our events team can be contacted for any further information and we'll be sharing further information in, in due time. <clears throat> and also again, um, watch your inbox, of course, for, for the slides and for the links to the recordings of, of this session. Don't hesitate to visit uh, wbcsd.org for, um, for any information on the roadmaps that we've been talking about, but also, of course, all of the work that we're doing around COVID-19, um, responding to it, but also tracking what business is doing uh, in, this, in this space. And I think with that, uh, we're at the end of the session, right on time. So again, thank you very much. Thank you as well, Filippo. Uh, thank you, Florian, for, for managing um, the technical side in the background. And thanks again to all of the panelists and uh, Lyndon as, as um, our moderator today. Thank you and uh, stay safe. <laughs>